Hi everyone, thank you for joining me. In this video I'm going to be talking about how it is best to prepare for a hike, whether it is a day hike or a multi-day hike, whatever duration you're going for is good to prepare and know what you're doing when you're setting off on a hike. So anyway, this video is going to be covering what equipment to take, ideal clothing, what sort of skills you should know and how to sort of forward plan and be tip top and prepared for anything. I hope you enjoy this video, I'm going to be covering various topics and going over a few things and recommending stuff that I like to use equipment wise and clothing. So the first thing I want to cover is the duration, so you have to pick the the duration and the rough mileage that you want to cover. So you could be going for a day hike or you could be going for a, a couple of nights or potentially longer. So you have to think about that because it does affect what you need to carry in your backpack and what you need to plan. So obviously the longer the hike, the more forward planning you need to have in advance when it comes to having enough food, having enough water, having enough clothing. So you might be doing, I don't know, let's say if you were doing a long distance hike it could be up to 60 miles or longer and you need to kind of calculate how many miles you can do a day roughly because anything could happen and can change the amount of distance you can cover in a day whether that's weather or just how you're feeling, your form might not feel good and you need to take a break and have your body needs a rest so that can kind of upset the balance. Knowing your average rough sort of pace you will know how many days you need to take out and how much food and equipment you need to take in order to give you a good hike and an enjoyable one because that's the whole idea of it. You're going to get out in nature, enjoy an uh, outdoor trail and really just soak it all in instead of worrying about staying dry and being hungry and things like that. You burn so many more calories as you're obviously walking and exercising and it's constantly just burning calories, especially if it's multi-day, it's an ongoing process. And if you're planning a wild camping or camping at campsites, that's more energy that you have to consume as you're having to set up your campsite, your tent or whatever, you're set up for the night. So you can either carry food with you and water with you, depending on your trail. Round here in the Surrey area, I have to carry all my water in a bladder and bottles. There's literally not much water sources around here, so I have to be dependent on myself to carry my own water. And that's where you have to kind of know roughly how much you consume a day and what you need. So I take, I roughly have about four and a half litres, and that does me for drinking, for cooking my food. Um, and any washing up I need to do. So there was loads of outside taps or places to fill up when I went on my hike, but I had to kind of plan that out and see where it was best to fill up. And then obviously food. Are you going to be stopping along the way for food or are you going to be carrying your own? So the best sort of meals to take hiking are rice and pastas, um, because they're quite light and simple meals, but also because they're full of carbohydrates which is a slow release energy which is good for hiking. They don't take that long on the gas stove. Obviously other people take dehydrated meals which is probably a lot more preferable, especially on longer hikes. And also sort of ration packs and boil in the bags, they're um, a very popular food source as well. Yes, yeah, so that's mainly that. That's the topic of food and water and being prepared for that because that is something that's really important when you're on a hike. So next topic is landscape and environment. So when you go on your hike you want to know the sort of rough terrain and the landscape that you are going to be covering on your hike. 
you want to know if there's a proper designated trail or you will have to use your navigational skills to work off the beaten track. There should be a lot of research and time spent on whatever trail you're going to do or whatever you want to cover so you don't get lost, people know where you are and you know what sort of equipment to take. Study a map, study any route, there's so many different research options on the internet now, it's crazy. You can literally type it in and it will come up on Google Maps. Terrain will change how much weight you are willing to carry. If you're doing a lot of inclines, you will definitely want to drop your weight. Just completely scrutinise it to get as light as possible. Yet again, depending on your size and your build and your strength or your fitness ability, that does change how much weight you can carry. Women obviously, on average, can't carry as much as men, so they have to kind of change their load or they typically hike with a partner, so either a male or a female, they share the load. But that doesn't mean that a woman can't hike on their own, they've just got kind of <laughs> grin and bear it and scrutinise their equipment and get it down as light as they can. Yet again, the heavier your load, the slower you're going to walk. So that you'd have to put extra hours on the mileage you're going to do each day. Landscape and environment also affects the footwear that you want to wear. So usually people wear boots, but maybe if you're in really marshy environments you would want to wear higher boots that come up higher on your leg. A lot of people go for the sort of ankle boots for hiking as they're quite comfortable, especially when you're mountain walking as there's a better bend in your boot. But I feel them boots don't offer a lot of ankle support. So when you're coming, you, they might be all right up a mountain, but coming down, you might not have as much ankle support as you would on a high, high footed boot. Marshy ground, you'd want fully waterproof Gore-Tex boots. A lot of people go for leather, a lot of people go for the mesh boots. I prefer leather due to them being a lot more waterproof, a lot more durable and um, they're just very comfortable boots. At the minute I've got the Hakes ones, but Hamwag makes some great boots, Lower do, um, Solomon makes some really nice boots also, but they're more mesh, and I guess with the mesh ones they're a lot more breathe, they're very breathable, and they're more suitable for summer conditions I would say. And that's what brings me to my next topic, which is weather forecast. Previous to your trip you should get the most accurate weather forecast you can and see what the weather is going to be for the duration you're going for. Some places you can't get signal so probably best to screenshot or jot down what the weather is going to be so you can look back at it. Obviously the weather can change like that um, in some places so it's not always don't always rely on what you've written down from a couple of days ago when you last had internet. I guess you can sort of read the weather yourself and that's by looking at cloud formations and seeing the sky before and before you go to sleep you could have clear skies but that could also change. So the clouds do offer a lot of what the weather's going to do in the next few hours. Also wind, if you've got very strong winds the weather's obviously going to change very rapidly. The reason why you should look at weather forecast and see what the rough temperature is going to be for the, the time of your year you're going somewhere is so you know what clothing to pack. So this is a major thing, what sort of clothing you should take when you're hiking. If you look and you see the weather is going to be torrential rain, you know that you need to get very high quality waterproof jacket, bottoms, waterproof boot, maybe gaiters for your boots and a waterproof cover for your rucksack. You might also need to think about taking spares as well because you can get soaked through and you want something to sleep in that night. Whether it is raining or not on your forecast you always want to take waterproof gear though especially if you're traveling in a place that is prone to rain a lot so that's the Lake District and Scotland and typically England on the whole rains a lot and the weather chops and changes. So not just with rain, you might have extreme heat wave and sunshine. You will want to pack sunscreen, you don't, burning and multiple burns is probably awful. 
especially if you've got to wear a backpack and you've got burn marks on you it's it's not going to be enjoyable when it's likely to be hot you're going to drink more so you need to take an advance that you will be taking on more liquids so you'll have to set out what water sources are along the way of your trail so you know where to fill up you'll also probably want to pack some sort of hat or different sort of clothing so you might want to take shorts and smaller top because it will be very hot especially when you're hiking in hot conditions and usually when it's hot it does attract midges so you would want to carry some sort of insect repellent especially if you are around water that's something that's so high up you might want to take a head net and an insect repellent so it does change what sort of gear that you do take dependent on the weather forecast and prior to your trip this is what I actually need to do is fab seal all of your equipment your waterproof stuff whether you use fab seal or nick wax I think it's called you need to do it before you go away if you're due for a lot of heavy downpours because at the end of the day you want to have waterproof gear and a waterproof tent and that you can rely on it you want reliable stuff so it's better to spend a little more but have a lot of faith in the equipment that you're using especially because you could easily get hypothermia if you're wet and you're cold and you're quite far out from any nearby town and you don't have phone signal things can get quite dangerous that way right my next topic is mapping out your route so route planning route planning involves a lot of hard work I guess being able to see where you can restock and get supplies where there's water on board on your hike and where you can collect food you might arrange another way of getting to the trail someone might drop you off and pick you up which is really handy but if not you'd have to put your research and time in and looking at terrain so on a map there is contour lines and uh, they change dependent on your map a lot of people do go for the OS map option they are great maps and very reliable and they've got a lot of detail on my one is the 125 in that one box it has a lot of detail the whole map's got a lot of detail for hiking and it's great because it shows me things that are on the map that I need to know um, and it, yeah it's essential to get a smaller map that covers more distances it's usually on a 125,000 map the contour interval on most maps are between 5 to 10 meters so that shows you the grade of the terrain and between each line is 5 10 meters so obviously the closer the lines are the steeper the gradient and the wider they are the um, less steep and um, usually it's flatter ground so you can see valleys and um, the, the shape through the contour you could see where an incline where there's an incline and a, de and a descent um, so you can read the terrain very well through the setup of contour lines there's plenty of videos um, and information on reading a map and looking at contour lines and sort of route planning and um, if anyone's interested I, I will do a video on that I haven't really covered that and done in many videos on that topic so I could potentially do that if someone's interested uh, leave it in the comments if you are you also by looking at the terrain see if there is anywhere available to set up camp so if you are planning and staying and while camping along route in your tent then you'll have to look at the terrain and see if it's all on a slope that's probably not the best place for camping and if you're at a real high altitude you know that you've got a high chance of storms you've got a high chance of rain and it's going to be quite cold so that will have to change your clothing and maybe the system of pegging in and having more support for your tent you might have to put rocks around the outside so it's very stable usually on higher ground um, if you're mountain, camping on mountains there isn't going to be much options for pegging in 
as the ground's just going to be full of rocks and it's going to be uneven. So the best option is to use large rocks and boulders to secure your tent to the ground, especially if there's high winds, that's something you really need to consider. And that's why else you should look at the weather forecast, which we covered in the previous topic, because high winds will change the way that you want to face your tent, uh, the way you want to peg it in, and where you want to be. You probably want to be in a more sheltered area, and um, if it's cold temperatures, you won't want to be inside a valley because the cold air will come down into the hollow that you're in. Just always forward planning and preparing and seeing what you've got for the next day. So you, that the evening before your hike, you can really get into your head what sort of terrain you've got coming up and where your water sources are and maybe you will have to carry more food because there might not be a place to stop along the way. Next topic is water sources. So that is pretty much like the first topic and the one we've just covered. Water sources, you will need to look what sort of water sources they are. You may have water along your trail, but what sort of water are we looking at? There might be water marked on your map. So that doesn't mean it is good enough for drinking. You ideally want to look for running water, so a stream or a river, uh, over stagnant. And if you are collecting from a lake, it is best to not collect what's on the top or the bottom. It's best to have in between because a lot of sediment and bacteria is on the top and obviously there's a lot of sediment laying on the bottom so getting them in the middle is the best part of the water it's going to be the cleanest it's not going to have loads of particles in there that you need to filter and purify but when you are you ideally want to look for running water a lot of people do drink straight from the streams and they think it's fresh but little did they little do you know there could be a dead, dead animal or a sheep or livestock that has just died a lot up the river only a few hundred yards or whatever and the bacteria from the sheep and the blood or whatever disease they might be carrying is now traveling down into your bottle that you're going to be drinking from so you have to take that in consideration there is a lot of bacteria there's e coli there is Gardia, there's loads of waterborne diseases and you have to be really careful because that could ruin your whole trip if you, you're not careful with that, if you're constantly getting diarrhea and you're throwing up um, and you've got an upset stomach, you're not going to enjoy your trip and you might have to postpone it for another time. So this is when you look into lightweight and durable systems that work for purifying water. So what I've got currently is the Soya Squeeze. So it's a tiny little filtering system with a plastic bag. What you do is you fill up the plastic bag in your water source um, and then you attach it to the little filter um, and then you just squeeze it, hence the name. And the flow rate is quite good on the soy squeeze and you can either drink straight from the bottle through the filter or you transfer it into your bottle you may be drinking while you're hiking. The only thing with soy squeeze is I'm not a huge fan of the bag. I think I need to up upgrade my bag and get a more stronger one. I've been getting a lot of holes and splits in it where it just it's not very strong plastic material. A friend of mine also had the same problem so I know it's not just me being heavy handed it's the bags they're a bit weak. Catadyne also do brilliant water filters and I also own one of theirs it's a 0 0.6 little bottle and you just put it straight in the water and it drinks straight from the bottle so it's a really quick system just like the soya squeeze um, but even quicker, you don't need to squeeze it through the filter, it does it naturally. And that's what you want and that's what you're looking for for hiking, really quick filters. Because you don't want to be faffing around 
and um, boiling water over a fire for instance especially if there's an area with no firewood or even getting your gas stove out having to set that up and boil water on the go it's just a longer process and you're going to be wasting gas other people use puri tabs they are quite good I don't think they are very reliable when it comes to getting rid of some bacteria that are in the water um, so don't count me on that I haven't really used Puri tabs only a few times. So one tablet purifies a certain amount. So you have to make sure you get a certain amount of water and you have to get a special container with that amount in. So you know that one tablet will purify that whole, how many litres or millilitres you have in a container. So there's loads of options on the market, but I personally use Soya Squeeze and I got on really well with it. It was reliable, just not the bag that I have so I'll probably upgrade on that and get a newer one uh, that's more robust. So that's water sources. Planning before and seeing where best on trail is to collect water from. If there's some nice running streams you want to be collecting from that and you don't want to be really collecting from stagnant water. If I was having to do that I probably would want to run it through my soya squeeze and then boil it just to be sure. Right, next one is campsites. So when you're on your hike, you want to be thinking of where you can sleep. So some people prefer to be and b some people might be just doing day hikes, some people might like wild camping, and some people like the luxury of going on a campsite. So it's completely up to you and what your preference is and what the availability is like on the trail. There might be no wild camping allowed, there might not be any places to wild camp, and um, there might not be any B&Bs or campsites, so you might be forced to wild camp. This is why you have to go into detail and really look into it, and kind of plan what where you'd like to stay, and maybe even book in advance for accommodation, if that's what you are planning on doing. A lot of people like B&Bs because you get food there and it's a nice luxury bed so you can sleep well and perform for the next day and if it is torrential weather you're in a nice environment that's warm and you can dry all your stuff out. Some people like campsites because you've got toilets, you've got showers um, and a lot of places do have food so you also will be surrounded by other campers and hikers that may be sharing the same hike as you and people like that sort of community spirit and somewhere that you can dry off your gear and have a nice shower after a long day hiking so that is another really nice way and then some people like wild camping just because they like having their own space being independent and getting that really nice feel of freedom and setting up somewhere that's really remote and there's no one about and you've just got a really peaceful night. So that's something you should look towards and see how much distance is between each campsite or B&B so you know what requirements to meet, meet each day. There might be 10 miles between each campsite so you know that you need to look at the terrain and water sources and see if you are going to make that distance for your fitness capabilities. Um, next topic really runs in with campsites, so shops. Shops for either buying camping equipment that has maybe broke or has really passed its sell by date, food and gas. Gas is a really important one, especially if you're dependent on cooking your own food um, and you need gas for your stove then that is another important option. Gas, a lot of people like the propane and butane gas bottles. Um, it's a nice mixture and they're really good. That is so they don't freeze and they last quite a long time as well, them gas bottles. So this is what else you need to calculate. How much gas are you gonna be burning each day and how many bottles are you gonna get through on your hike? So you can uh, restock in time and not be kind of worrying because you're relying on a tiny bit of gas. You want to buy your next gas bottle before your previous one has already run out. You don't want to get to that point where you, you're wild camping, you're quite remote and you've got uh, a meal to cook and then 
bingo, your gas has run out and you're stuck with cold, uncooked meal. And that could be rice. So imagine eating cold, hard rice. That wouldn't be that, that tasty. So it's good to be forward planning all the time and know that you can have enough gas to cook your rice and maybe even a brew as well for a bit of a luxury. And maybe go on a trip previous to your major big trip just to try out your gas and how much you do have. You might like a brew every morning, you might be dependent on having a coffee uh, every morning and that does take gas. So you need to kind of calculate how much water you need for your coffee and how long does that take on your gas stove. And then food wise, will you be staying at a and b and buying your food? or will you be cooking it on your own gas stove? And making sure that the shops do sell the right gas that fits your head on your stove. So there's so many different stoves, you need the right gas for your one. And if you're a bit of a muppet like myself, I went to Glasgow last year. I assumed that you could take gas on a plane. I know, it was very silly. I got there to find out wow I can't take gas on board so I instantly was a bit panicking because I was thinking what gas am I going to use now but luckily there was a place in Glasgow that sold the correct gas that fitted my stove I have a primer stove and it's a push and twist system so it fitted luckily which I was happy about but um, I had got three little blue bottles, I'm not sure the measurements of it, but they lasted me for the two weeks I was there and I used that for porridge in the morning, I had a brew in the morning and I had a rice meal in the evenings and that lasted me so I was really happy with that. And then shops, you want shops that are going to supply some nice foods along the way, you don't want to be relying on really just snacking on food you want some nice decent meals to be cooking along the way that are not too heavy and that are not going to go off you don't want to be carrying bacon and steaks and everything so you want products that have long life on them the so porridges pastas dehydrated meals boil in the bags them sort of things that are going to last you a long time and um, powdered milk instead of fresh milk the next one is kind of back on the environment you're going to be in. Where is your hike going to be? Is it If it's going to be set in a forested area, then you can rely on having fires at, because you know there's plenty of wood. So in the evenings, you'd only have to do a small amount of work if you're in a big forest to light a fire and make sure you leave no trace, you clear the ground and you've got a fire for heat for boiling your water, for cooking your food. So that's going to save you a lot of gas in the long run if you are doing that. And maybe you won't even need to carry a gas stove with you if you are going to be having open fires. Obviously you have to check and make sure you are allowed them or you're very cautious with it and you leave no trace. You scatter the uh, cold embers from the night before. Or, and put the fire out and make sure it's just left with no trace because if someone does it it's going to ruin it for other people and maybe a forest that did allow people to have fires might change their rules because of you so just be respectful and leave no trace as well in forested areas you might choose if it's nice weather to make your own shelters along the way so you might just make a little lean-to construction with a tarp and that's it. You might not want to take a tent because um, you're going to be just carrying a tarp because it supplies a lot more configurations, you've got t trees to attach it to and you just take a ridge line and a piece of tarp lightweight and that could be you sorted. In mountainous areas you want a tent ideally, you don't really want to be carrying a tarp because there's a lot of uh, pegging points and you can't always peg in on a mountain because it's very rocky. So you would want a tent with a ground sheet that's got a fly net because the, you do get a lot of mozzies in the mountains and that's very highly waterproof. The tent I use is the Van Gogh Banshee 
Pro and that is amazing. It's a two man tent but it's perfect for one. Um, it's great ideal for myself and my equipment. It's got a large festival so I put my rucksack in there and a few bits and bobs inside my tent. It's extremely waterproof, it's very reliable. I've had a couple of problems with the poles but I was in, a, there was a storm, high winds and the poles snapped on me. Uh, Van Gogh were very lovely and they sent me pole repairs, uh, replacement poles and when there is no places pegging points then I do use rocks on the outside and that does work as well. Next topic is distance. So how long is your hike going to be? And um, this is mainly to do with training. So preparing for your hike a few weeks or months before to get yourself into training of being able to hike that distance. So you might have a goal of covering, I don't know, maybe 10 miles a day and you need to get into the system and the pattern of doing 10 miles over a course of time. And then you have to sort of think about weight as well. So you need to load your backpack with stuff that you potentially take with you or even heavier so it's easier for you when you do the real thing. Take um, maybe two kilos heavier so you get used to carrying that weight and when it comes to a lighter load it'll feel a little bit easier. So this is obviously good practice, it makes you fitter, it makes you a lot stronger. Being able to carry a backpack with a heavy load and walking uh, high mileage with it is essential. But also getting into the system of walking each day, setting up your tent, being organised and um, just being organised with your gear and making sure it's all set up correctly your tent you're not slacking with the pegging points and putting out the guy lines so if there was a high winds you're you've got a lot of trust in your tent you're not going to be sitting up at night worrying should I go out in it and re-peg it and potentially get soaked so getting into the system of that cooking on a gas stove that does take require quite a bit of skill you don't want to whack your stove on full heat to get your dinner on quick because you're then going to burn whatever your meal is. And training, so when you go into your hike, it's not going to be a complete shock to the body going, wow, I've got to hike all of this and be walking each day because that, that can then lead to injury and that will ruin your hike if you do get injured along the way. So it's best to start off small with training and build up gradually. It's not good to just go full in and go, yeah, I'm gonna do 20 miles a day and I'm gonna do it over a month with 20 kilo rucksack and you've never done hiking before. You're definitely gonna be getting some injuries or you're just not gonna enjoy it. It's gonna be so painful and you'll get muscle aches and it's not gonna be enjoyable and it'll probably put you off the whole idea of it and knock your confidence thinking that you can't do it. So it's best to start off really small, dependent on your fitness ability, with no weight, and then build from there, keep adding stuff into your backpack until you feel good with the weight that you're carrying, and uh, then you get a rough gauge of how much weight you can carry for the real hike. Yet again, there is plenty of forums and videos of how to train and prepare for a hike physically, but also mentally, there is a lot of mental things especially if you're doing a hike solo you're going to be with yourself all day uh, so you're going to be in your thoughts all the time there's no distractions there's no stimulus so it's just going to be you and yourself on this trail you need to be very organized with your equipment you need to forward plan you need to be really self-motivated to get up early and get the walking in and then um, setting up and getting your head down to sleep for the next day. You've got to be quite confident especially if you are thinking of doing wild camping and you're not relying on campsites and B&Bs. You need to be confident and independent and have all the right equipment and know how to set it up. So that what it brings me to the next part. You should always test gear before a major trip. So you should test your tent, you should know how to set up the tent and you should carry stuff so you like a repair kit so if your tent does break you can fix it 
when I went to Scotland I just said that my tent poles unfortunately snapped luckily I was carrying black tape and I could repair the poles um, which was very handy and I had a little repair kit for my tent you should test out your stove you should know how the fit works on it you should test your sleeping bag and know that it's warm enough for the conditions that you're going in um, your roll mat you should know that it stays up all night and it's comfortable to lay on loads of different factors but you should always test your gear make sure it's waterproof it's durable and that you get on well with it and that you know how to use it being comfortable with hiking partners for a longer term so if you are going solo you should be used to your own company and you should know yourself really well and know that you operate well by yourself T typically you will meet a lot of people along the way so you won't be solo all the time you can walk the trail with somebody or um, just meet like-minded people along the way so it's not going to be very lonely if you are planning on going with people make sure that you get on very well with them it's a long time and you will all be very tired and maybe frustrated sometimes if you haven't met your goal for the day so make sure you're very comfortable with them and that you enjoy each other's company obviously you might have fallouts when you're very you're on the edge you're very tired it's been a long day people are going to get snappy but don't let other people ruin your hike take appropriate spares so really take into account that you might need repair kits with spares you might need spare clothing um, spare gas things like that because if something does break you want a backup but don't overdo it and take the whole kitchen sink because you'll just be down you'll be weighed down with so much weight and that's what it is hiking does take a lot of cutting your gear and thinking what do I really need to take and um, prioritizing things and the correct skills for the environment and where you're going do you have the skills that you need you might need to map read a lot of your trail and know how to read a compass and know how to map read to get you along the trail some trails are signposted but some are not mountains mountain walking skills there might be a trail with a lot of mountains you need to know um, how to climb a mountain without having potential injuries and be able to nav there as well so yeah they're the main sort of topics that I wanted to cover and how to prepare for a hike this does vary from your ability the trail you're doing and the duration it's over it does vary so so you can take my tips and change it from what sort of hike you're doing but the main thing is to really enjoy yourself, respect where you are, don't leave any rubbish, don't leave any trace, and just soak up where you are. You're on a hike and you're adventuring, and it's, it should be amazing. You're gonna meet lovely, like-minded people along the way, and you should really enjoy your time. So I think I've mostly covered ev everything. I think so anyway. Please uh, leave in the comments if you'd like me to cover sort of any navigational videos or like the contour lines like I said earlier and I will do a video on it. So I'm near enough losing my voice now because I've chatted for quite a while but I've tried to get a lot of information into this video and cut it down as much as I can. Thank you so much for watching and thank you to everyone for subscribing and getting me to 80k. I cannot believe it, it's such a huge milestone. So thank you so much. And also a massive thank you to all my patrons for supporting my channel and uh, keeping me going on YouTube. Take care.